Hello, welcome to another edition of Oklahoma Politics and You. I'm your host, Steve Bias, along with Gary Cooper is the other host. And tonight our guest is Hopper Smith. And uh, Hopper Smith is now the leader of the uh, Oklahoma Council of Public Affairs, sometimes called Oklahoma's uh, Heritage Foundation, Oklahoma's American Enterprise Institute. Uh, it's Oklahoma's leading conservative think tank. And here's the thinker himself, uh, <laughs> Hopper Smith. And I, uh, Hopper, I'm, I'm not quite sure what uh, title to call you since you've had so many. You've been state representative, you've been a colonel uh, right. in, the, in the National uh, National Guard, National Guard yes. and, and now you're president of the Oklahoma Council of Public Affairs. So uh, I guess I'll just kind of call you as, as we go through each topic here. <laughs> you can uh, call me Hopper. Okay, or call you <laughs> Hopper. <laughs> Uh, okay. Well, tell us a little bit about, before we get into your professional uh, background, the three things we're going to talk about, your, your time in the state legislature, uh, uh, your time in, the, in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. and also now your time with the Oklahoma Council of Public Affairs. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your background, sure. where you grew up, sure. uh, your education, and that sort of thing. Grew up in, uh, in Tulsa and uh, was raised by uh, uh, a man who was a World War II veteran. He was a Navy pilot in World War II, and uh, he was a, also a physician, and uh, uh, so grew up with a strong, uh, conservative, free market um, uh, upbringing, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, later on in, in life, when I, I graduated with a degree in geology from Oklahoma State, uh, then went uh, and worked in the private sector for for many years, and uh, then after that, I was uh, in 1996 was elected to the Oklahoma State House, and uh, from Tulsa, representing a, a district in South Tulsa, uh, and then from uh, from there uh, in uh, 2003. Um, Actually, when I uh, graduated from high school, I enlisted in the National Guard to help pay for school. And uh, a lot of kids do that. It's a great way to help augment your, uh, your income for education, for gaining a higher education. And uh, uh, so I was commissioned uh, in 1983 as a second lieutenant in the infantry in Oklahoma's uh, 45th Infantry uh, Brigade. Mm -hmm. It's the same unit my uh, uncles uh, served in in World War II in Korea, and the same unit my cousin was in. So there's a lot of lineage there with uh, with our family in the 45th. Uh, when the 45th was mobilized in 2003, I was then serving in the house, and so I mobilized with my unit. I did the same thing that uh, thousands of other Oklahomans and and Americans have done all across yeah. the United States. They when their units called up, they go. Whatever they're doing, they leave and they go. And uh, and so that's that's what I did, and and uh, I had a, a great experience in Afghanistan. Uh, was served as one of the uh, embedded trainers, or now they call them embedded advisors, um, which is uh, a unit that serves directly with, in this case, the Afghan army, uh, and uh, in Iraq, it's obviously the Iraqi army. But we worked every day with uh, with Afghans that were fighting for their own freedom, and in a sense, fighting for ours. Okay. Uh, and uh, so then came back from there and take it from there. Okay. And uh, so, uh, okay, let, let's go back to the, your, your days in the State House of Representatives. Okay. And uh, what, uh, you said you ran in 1996 is sure. when you were first elected. And uh, what, uh, had you been involved in the politics sure. before that time? Sure. I, I had been involved in grassroots politics for years. Uh, and uh, actually first started getting interested in, in uh, political issues at the state level with the, all the controversy surrounding House Bill 1017 and the Education Reform Act and, and, uh, and so that's where I first started getting my feet wet was uh, on the Speaker's Bureau of the, uh, uh, of the House Bill 1017 issue um, and uh, that, bef that was a time before they had OCPA, Oklahoma mm -hmm. Council of Public Affairs, and, and we sure could have used a, a think tank to help, you know, pull some of the information together. But yeah. but I thought the the uh, the um, organization did a very uh, uh, very good job in, in trying to um, stop the implementation of House Bill 1017 and and uh, and repeal it. Um, uh, but anyway, so that's where I got my feet wet, and then uh, got involved in in precinct politics and county level. Uh, mm -hmm. Politics and and from there, then I ran for the state house and and won. Was there any particular driving issue that caused you to want to get involved in the state legislature? Or, or well, I think for me, you know, it's always been a, a, an overarching uh, 
love of liberty and the, mar the free market and uh, the, the freedoms that we enjoy and the free society. You know, uh, um, pre some previous presidents had talked about the great society and, and really what we have is, it, and have and should embrace and should continue to perpetuate is, is our free society mm -hmm. and, and the tenets that that is based on. And, and it was in the House that I, that I formed Hopper's two principles of good government. Okay. And, and first principle is that uh, God created man to be free. That's principle number one. There's a lot loaded into that. I mean, that, you can take that in a lot of different directions. It has a lot of implications to it. So that God created man to be free. That's principle number one. Principle number two is government is not your mommy. So if you look at God created man to be free and government is not your mommy, if you take those two principles and, and apply them to most legislation that, is, uh, that comes before the oh, yeah. House or the Senate, then that's a, good, that's a good, uh, pretty good screen to use to determine what should pass and probably what should not pass. Okay. Gary, are there some questions you'd like to ask you Hopper about his time in the State House? Of course, you were elected in 1996 at a time when Democrats held control of both the State House and the yeah. State Senate. Yes. And I'm sure there were a great many uh, items of legislation you wish you could have gotten passed sure. in those early years. <laughs> now we have a Republican control of the House. We have a tied state Senate. We've already seen legislation get passed so far that we would have never dreamed of in the old days. And I notice now with your uh, activity with Oklahoma Council of Public Affairs, you're in a position to actually influence sure. uh, conservative legislators and others uh, for now and the future with this kind of thing. What are some of the... Um, the issues that the Oklahoma Council of Public Affairs involves itself in, what does it do to further conservative principles, et cetera? It's, it, is, it looks at issues through a free market lens uh, and one of uh, free markets, individual liberty, and, in, and individual enterprise. So those are kind of the, the, uh, the planks uh, of, the, of the OCPA's platform, if you will. Is it, those are the things that they uh, look at and try to uh, promote. Um, and so those tend to gravitate around economic issues, um, not so much moral issues. Uh, although I would say that the you know the board of directors at OCPA and certainly the folks that work at OCPA all have strong moral principles and have you know our individual beliefs about other sorts of issues that have a moral component to them. The organization itself tends to gravitate around economic issues. Um, one of those, for instance, is um, that 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 is a, a correlative issue would be uh, educational freedom or educational choice. Uh, so that some might say, well, that's you know not an economic issue, uh, but it is an we, it is an issue that has e economic ramifications and certainly has uh, a um, um, an aspect of individual freedom to it. Uh, you know, do individuals have um, should they be given greater freedom to do with their money as, as they wish regarding educational choice? Uh, so that's, a, that's an area that, we've, uh, that OCPA has emphasized and really was, uh, you know, as it kind of things come around to full circle. Um, for me personally, I first got started on uh, the education reform issue uh, way back when and, uh, and uh, now uh, OCPA, is, that's one of their uh, principal uh, objects, but others as well, uh, tax reform, tort reform, uh, others that are a little more economic and they're, uh, you know, have a more stronger economic flavor to them. What are some of the activities that your organization uh, does to influence uh, legislation and government in general? Do you have publications? Sure, we have activities? a monthly publication perspective. There are, there's a, uh, a website that uh, OCP ha OCPA has, it's www dot ocpa think dot org okay. uh, and uh, and a lot of that that's those are two of the primary um, media that we use to get uh, uh, information out also we have an annual citizenship award dinner uh, that ha usually has great speakers uh, 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 that are honored at it it's a it's a great event usually have about a thousand people attend um, uh, a great uh, collection of conservative minds and, and uh, movers and shakers. So um, there's that. We also have our summer speaker series, which is going on right now. We just had Dinesh D'Souza last month. Mm -hmm. uh, great, great uh, speaker on the, uh, he's written several books, some mm -hmm. of which you may know. Next we have kind of one of uh, Oklahoma's homegrown, um, Steve, um, uh, 
Russell, Steve Russell, Colonel Steve Russell. He was with the uh, 4th Infantry Division in Iraq and was one of the battalion commanders that was responsible for the capture of Saddam Hussein. And he's from Oklahoma City, oh, the yeah. Oklahoma City area. Mm -hmm. um, I think he's actually from Dale City. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, great, great guy. He'll be uh, coming up uh, in, I think it's Octo uh, August 1. August 1 is, is uh, when his speaking date is in Oklahoma City. So uh, several things like that. Mm -hmm. that, that uh, what are some of the, I know we've just uh, been wrapping up a, a recent legislative session of the state legislature. What are some of the, say, top three or four issues that you see looking ahead in the immediate future that you think would be big concerns of your group for Oklahoma? Either concerns or things you look forward to being able to accomplish or things you're concerned, worried about, that sort of thing. Well, near term, uh, and that's within the, you know, say the next upcoming session mm -hmm. of the legislature, uh, tort reform part dough, you know, is, is, is something that we'll, we'll continue to advocate. Um, uh, and then some, some tax reform issues that uh, uh, continued reduction in the income tax, which is a, as far as a, a capitalist perspective is concerned, the income tax is, is a, a punitive tax. There are other ways to, uh, to tax, um, you know, the populace or the, the economy is really what you end up taxing, uh, other than a personal income tax that don't have quite the, the negative effect that a personal income tax does. And what it does is it, it ends up chasing capital away from the state. So uh, continued reduction in the personal income tax is something that, that we would uh, advocate. And then uh, there's always um, a school choice moving more and more toward injecting free market in, uh, uh, components into the educational equation, whether it's public schools or charter schools or you know, private schools or homeschooling. Um, individuals should have greater choice uh, in deciding how their, where their children attend school and where those dollars flow. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are many mechanisms to do that with, but individuals will always make generally always make a, a, a better decision than a government bureaucrat uh, that's in Oklahoma City or Washington DC or anywhere. Does your group have any uh, views or, or uh, uh, activities involving uh, dealing with the issue of the impact of uncontrolled immigration, particularly illegal immigration? Not, not really. That isn't an issue that we've uh, embraced and it certainly has the issue of immigration certainly has state uh, you know, the ripple effects uh, affects the, the state. Um, uh, but it's, and I know that the legislature has passed a, a bill that is, uh, uh, is, is fairly significant mm -hmm. regarding immig immigration. Uh, we know it's a very hot issue, but it's, but it's a little bit outside of what our core issues are, so we really haven't gotten on that, uh, on that yet. And it's one of those issues that if you're in for a penny, you're in for a pound. I mean, if you, if you get into it, you better study it very, very closely and know what you're talking about before you immerse yourself into it um, because it's a, it's a very uh, intense issue. Steve? It certainly has an economic impact. It There's does, it does. And, and there are, uh, it seems like it does kind of lend itself to the type of analysis on, the, on what is the economic impact of illegal immigration, right, and, for and the that state sort of thing, uh, and, and analyzing that sort of thing. I, I've, you know, I've heard a lot of people make the comment uh, that uh, I don't want to, you know, get off into legal immigration because we've we've spent a whole program right, yeah. on that. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, I've heard people say things like, uh, "Our strength is immigra immigration." And, well, yeah. immigrants have obviously added a whole lot to the United States. Like, you know, you take Irving Berlin, uh, wrote God Bless America, sure. and, and of course then we had the Stalinist Woody Guthrie who didn't like the song and wrote his, his <laughs> response. But, but really, I think it's kind of getting it opposite. What caused well, all these people well, to I come that, here is yeah. how great we well, are. Well, that's not right. The other that's way right. Around. When, when I hear things like that, that our, our strength is our diversity and, and things like that, I say, well, no, our strength is the, the, the principles of liberty. Yes. And, and that we are diverse is inescapable, but that's it's not really... It's a result really, of the liberty. Well, no, it's, no. It's, it is to say that, uh, that uh, it's like if you're in a football huddle and you say, well, our strength is in our diversity. Well, it's true that the, you know, the center <laughs> is different than the wide receiver and different than the quarterback, but that their strength comes in a unified action taking advantage of their, of their yeah. diversity or their differences. So it's not, it's not really correct, I don't think, analytically correct to say our strength is is a, a, a uh, an effect 
uh, for, and the cause is diversity. I mean, that's yeah. not really uh, correct to say, but, but anyway, it is somewhat flattering that we have a, a pro the problem that we have with Im immigration. People are dying to get here. It's a great place. And when I was in Afghanistan, you know, our interpreters who could speak English, obviously, would ask us, it was invariable, they'd ask us, how can I come to the United States and come to the universities in the United States? They, they all wanted oh, yeah. to come to the United States. And so that was very, that's very flattering. And, and um, but, you know, yeah, but it's I, still, you have to, a sovereign nation has to have control yeah. of its borders, and that's uh, one of the bottom lines. I was watching, uh, uh, I'd never seen it before, the hunt for Red October, and mm -hmm. I ran it the other night, and you know, this, and it, and it seems so trivial in a way, but I don't know if you saw the movie or not, but one of the, the crew members that defected to the United States in that movie, he's, he got killed and he was dying, he said, I never got to see Montana. Yeah, you know? I remember well, that. I remember and that. I thought that just kind of sums it all up, yeah. you know, I mean, it seems trivial, but uh, that, uh, Kind of shifting gears here, Gary's pretty well covered a lot of things on the Council of Public Affairs, but I want to ask one more thing about, uh, I know that a lot of uh, members of the Democratic Party uh, will say this uh, Oklahoma Council of Public Affairs is a Republican organization, and how would you answer them on that? Um, no, uh, it's not a Republican organization. Uh, it it is a. It is exactly you know what I just said. It uh, it was. It's a. It's an. Or, it's a think tank that is uh, is dedicated to uh, researching and uh, and broadcasting and, and disseminating information that uh, is uh, and advocates free markets, uh, individual uh, enterprise, and limited government. Uh, now, if one party tends to trend toward those principles more than the other party, that's not. OCPA's direction. I mean, that's that's just uh, yeah. how the parties tend to gravitate. And there are members of um, there are members of the Democrat Party that are members of OCPA. They those are individuals who believe in individual liberty, limited government, and individual enterprise. And there are many de Democrats out there that yeah. believe in that. And, and some of them are my friends from the legislature that I had the pleasure to serve with. That's great. Uh, are now, are you still in the National Guard? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm. Um, a uh, colonel in the National Guard. Uh, well, you know, just stop me if any, at any point here there are things you can't okay. talk about, okay. you know, but uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your time in Afghanistan and do you think that uh, this is something that uh, the United States sure. should, be in, should have been involved in in Afghanistan? Oh, I, absolutely. I think the important thing for folks to, re one of the important things for folks to remember is the war did not start on September 11th. It was September 11th when we could not deny anymore that we were at war. There were several actions by uh, Islamic jihadists, uh, Islamic fascists, whatever you want to call them, uh, previous uh, to uh, September 11th um, that uh, were acts of war. Uh, the the uh, uh, attempted sinking of the USS Cole a year previous to that. Um, the uh, bombing of the Kobar Towers, the bombing of our embassies elsewhere. You know, there have been several acts. Mm -hmm. if, if we were to withdraw from Afghanistan and Iraq and say, okay, the war is over, the war wouldn't be over. The war didn't start on September 11th, and it, it wouldn't end the day that we decided to withdraw because they have a choice, the bad guys, the enemy has a choice too, and they've chosen mm -hmm. to, to uh, propagate this war. One of the difficulties that it is for, for Americans in particular to understand is we're not at war with a nation state. It's not like we're at war with Imperial Japan or Germany or North Korea where you take your armies, you march into their capital, you sign articles of surrender, and that's, that's, how, we, that's how we play that game. Um, it, that's, not this, that's not how this game is played. Um, there, so there are different principles at work there. Um, the, the, but as far as the, the justness of the cause, I absolutely believe in it. Mm -hmm. And there are thousands of Afghans, thousands of Iraqis that are staking their future on the United States ha maintaining the will to win. And, uh, uh, and, I, and I feel very strongly about uh, our continued support of those freedom fighters. There's a lot of Iraqis that have died. We've lost 3,500 soldiers. There's a lot of Iraqis that have died, a lot of Afghans that have died in, this, in their fight for freedom yeah. and, and our fight for freedom. Well, you know, in, uh, uh, you know, of course, in Afghanistan, it was obviously a much more popular war. And I've always said, you know, people talk about popular wars. Every war that you're winning is popular, <laughs> yeah. you know. Yeah. I mean, uh, Vietnam was a popular war up until the, probably the Tet Offensive, yeah. you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, in, Af 
in Iraq, uh, one of the things is that, uh, of course, I have a lot of problems with President Bush, but one of the, my problems with President Bush is that he, he has done such a poor job, I think, of explaining the case for Iraq. Well, I mean, he talks about how many schools were built in Iraq, and that, that's all good. But is that people, America, average American thinks, well, that's not worth having people well, killed. Uh, so, so what, make the case for, for being well, in Iraq. Well, th I, I think that the administration has, has made a, uh, a, a very, I think, a very comprehensive case for, uh, for both Afghanistan and Iraq. But I would ask you this. If, you're, if one is opposed to war in Iraq, why would one be in favor, that same one, be in favor of the war in Afghanistan? And that person may reply, well, because Afghanistan, you know, attacked us. And I say, no, they didn't attack us. Al-Qaeda attacked mm -hmm. us. The Taliban government in Afghanistan did not attack us. So uh, what they didn't do is they didn't cough up Al-Qaeda when, and we knew Al-Qaeda was operating out of Afghanistan with their support and consent. Yeah. So, so... If you say that, okay, the war in, uh, in Afghanistan, keeping that principle in mind, if the war in Afghanistan is justified based on that, then, you, then one can and should say, then the war in Iraq is also justified based on mm. that. Um, uh, we, we know now, although it's not, you know, you don't hear about it from the popular press, we know now that, yes, there were operatives operating inside of Iraq, and, and the, the government of Iraq knew about it and turned a blind eye and permitted those elements to operate inside mm -hmm. of Iraq, train in Iraq, and execute operations outside of Iraq. Yeah, and the other thing that a lot of people have said uh, is that, well, uh, uh, it, it's almost like a straw man deal that, okay, we went to war against Iraq because he had weapons of mass destruction. Well, I don't really think that was it. It's the, it's the support that Saddam Hussein was giving to terrorists there, like Abu Nidal, you know, had a safe haven, for example, in Iraq. There are a number of, of, uh, of individual justifications for war I in Iraq, not the least of which is the, that he failed to comply with the, the Articles of Surrender from the war in 1991. Legally, according to yeah. international law, if you fail to comply with those Articles of Surrender, game's back on. Yeah. So uh, he, uh, Saddam Hussein failed to comply with those Articles of Surrender. Um, uh, another uh, component is, is he uh, periodically engaged our aircraft in the no-fly yeah. zone. Uh, so he was carrying out aggressive acts against uh, U.S. soldiers and U.S. airmen. There are a number of, uh, of reasons other than weapons of mass destruction. It was the popular media that latched on to weapons of mass destruction, and, and that's why that is such a popular rebuttal, I guess, to the war, is he didn't have weapons of mass destru destruction, therefore the war is illegitimate, regardless of all the other uh, uh, rationale for the war. Got about a minute and a half, Gary. Do you have any other questions for sure. our guests? Uh, one last question I would ask is, uh, based on your experience, uh, with in Afghanistan with your with your unit, um, what would you say? Kind of to sum it up, what would you say is the the feelings that the Afghans that you did encounter, mm -hmm. interpreters, mm -hmm. fellow military men, yep. police, etc., citizens? What is their opinion of uh, of America as a country? What we've done for them in terms uh, of, of overthrowing the Taliban and right. what they've done since? There, uh, I remember one time I was traveling with uh, uh, an officer, uh, and I asked him about that. I asked him that very question. And uh, uh, why are your soldiers fighting with us? And, and uh, uh, he said, because you're not like the Russians. Um, you, your soldiers behave themselves. They don't get drunk. They, you know, they're professional. They, and, and there's not a lot of them. I mean, there's like 15, 18,000 soldiers in uh, Afghanistan. It's not like the Russians came in and, and it looked like they were conquering the country. Uh, so we're not, you know, we're not taking over the country. It was uh, a, a liberation. And they're very glad to be out from underneath the boot of the Taliban. They hated the Taliban. The ones, the, the freedom-loving Afghans hated the Taliban. Um, so uh, the mm. Afghans that I encountered were very supportive. And those are, include Afghans on the street in towns all over, all over Afghanistan. Okay. Uh, we thank you very much for being thank with us. Thank you very program. much. Thanks. Okay. Thank, thank you, you for being with us this evening. And please join us next time for another edition of Oklahoma Politics. And you. Thank you very much. Good job, Al. Fastest 28 minutes in television <laughs> there.